Yeah, and, you are more powerful than you think. Oh, well, how powerful do you think I think I am? Yeah, pretty freaking powerful. That's why we're on there. Before we started this live, I just had a conversation with, with Dr. Fred for a good 15 minutes about all the coronavirus stuff and some of the legality of what you can and cannot say, some of the like truth of what you should say. And there's a lot of good points that Fred just made that I'm like, yeah, that's a really good freaking point. Um, so let's just go. And then we decided, let's just go live instead of doing this whole thing on the back end. And so let's let's start going through that. Probably prior to starting with the first example, why don't you jump in to talk about why it's not just about communicating about coronavirus, it's the fear of coronavirus. Yeah, so what we are is we're not, and we're really not in a viral pandemic. We're in an emotional pandemic, right? And I've made a couple of videos on this already. So go to my Facebook, Dr. Fred D. Domenico, you can see those. But really that's what is the emotional pandemic. Why? Because it's the hysteria and the fear of the unknown. So what is it? Virus you can't see. It's unpredictable. They really don't know what the effects are because it's just genetically manufactured, right? So, so it's all this gloom and doom, and you guys know this, but what's the emotion of it? We're coming down to fear and survival. Why is it fear and survival? Because the only answer that medicine has offered, which this is a medically dominated country, is... is it's unpredictable. Call that word, um, quarantine. I just blanked on the word. Is quarantine, which which means what? It's the typical medical model. It's watch, wait, and hope. Isn't it watch, wait, and hope? I mean, that's what it is. Think about it. You go to a medical, well, I'm getting my once a year checkup. You know what's that mean? They look at your blood pressure. Well, one out of two Americans die of heart attacks, right? They take a blood test. That has nothing to do. You could have stage four cancer, have normal blood tests because that was my wife that passed away with blood with, from, with, uh, from breast cancer. Normal blood tests while she's in stage four metastatic cancer. So we know that that doesn't work. So that puts people into this powerless state. So how do they take power? They get hysterical. So what do they do? They buy the toilet paper. They buy the food. Now, some people may say, well, that may, makes logic because of quarantine. But why the hysterical buying? because it's the fear of survival. Now, here's the thing. When that fear is so great and you're in a herd mentality, state, the momentum, the emotional momentum of the herd, it's called social proof, will override any factual information that you're gonna give them. So you can go, well, chiropractor helps the immune system. They don't care. You know, they're watching restaurants close down and they're watching the news and they're watching everything shut down and their kids are home from school. That has a way bigger emotional impact on their emotions. So how the question becomes, how do we deal with this? And that's where we're going. So you got to know, right? So now yeah. you say something? No, no. Okay. I'm, I'm tracking. So, hey, after studying 21 years of human behavior, they're being put into a victim position, meaning something is being done to me and I'm powerless against it. And that's why they go out and buy toilet paper, right? And rubbing alcohol. So so if your biggest thing was washing your hands, we know that's an outside. And do people need to wash their hands? Yes. Is there now I'm not trying to downplay, so get let me get this straight. Are we in, a, in an infectious disease situation? No question. Are there people that are gonna die from coronavirus? Oh yeah, just like from the flu or anything else. Do we really know the full effect at this point? No. Should we limit our interaction with people? Yes. Does that mean limiting your interaction is going to stop the spread of coronavirus? Not at all. Because it's airborne. So here's how you get the coronavirus. One word, breathe. That's all you got to do. Yes, you can limit it a little bit by not, you know, giving everybody big wet kisses and hugging every stranger that you see. But all you have to do is go out go outside and basically you have some exposure but here's the principle that we teach healthy people don't get sick bottom line healthy people don't get sick now if you're going to pierce that emotional fear you need strong one-liners you need questions and you need strong one-liners so here's another one they say healthy people get sick but there's the appearance of health and then there's the state of health that's different. And you're here, your patients come to you because they want to be in the state of health. And the state of health is protection and confidence. 
Now, when people are being assaulted, because that's what they feel like, they're being assaulted by a virus, what's their main concern? Protection. So to, to actually teach the principle of thriving, they're not going to understand it because they're so deep in the fear, they can't even get into something positive. So the way you begin to help them is through protection and safety. How do they meet the need? What's happening is they are so uncertain that we have to give them certainty. And the primary positive intent of survival is protection. So we have to start equal to the level of su survival in our language. And that is protection. Now, here's what you base your information on. When I was when we were out there doing the Move Now weekend, Todd, yep, back to health, here we go. So I wrote this book because I took studies, all the research that Dan Murphy did, medical studies that show how postural problems, curve changes, cause stress in the spinal cord, put us in a sympathetic overload, break down our immune system, which is the science. It's called neuroimmunology, right? What's OG mean? Neuroimmunology. It's the study or the science of the neuroanatomy connected with the immunology. It's neurology is connected with immunology. It's that it's a science, neuroimmunology. And so this talks all about neuroimmunology and what medical studies prove that people with abnormal curves, forehead, head posture, traction on the cord, how it reduces immune systems, causes immune weakness, autoimmune disease, leads to cancer, uh, digestive problems, heart problems, lung problems, all these problems, as well as including a shortened lifespan and early mortality. These studies are in this book. Now, when, what Todd addressed is you're looking at the legalities of what we teach. Now, we're not sitting here saying chiropractic cures a weakened immune system. But what we're saying is chiropractic takes the stress off the cord and energy through the system. That's what the immune system is dependent on. And you have science to back you. So we don't treat anything. The only thing that we're aware of is the spot. All we do is that of changing curves in the spine. It's all in the more energy in the body. The neuroimmunological connection boosts the immune system. And so as a metaphor, two words, jumpstart. People understand jumpstart because you jumpstart a dead battery, right? So what are they doing when you, when you, when you correct a curve, when you take stress off the cord and you put nerve energy, you're jumpstarting your nervous system. Jumpstart your nerve because it puts more energy. There is studies that show and uh, that when you when you change the curves, it reduces nerve flow. So when you correct curves, it increases nerve flow. We can automatically make that assumption that if you lose a curve, it decreases. And that if you restore the curve, it must increase. Mm -hmm. So if it increases, you're jump starting the nerve system. If the nervous systems have jump started, what's the obvious correlation? Jump start the immune system. But we're not yeah. treating the immune system, right? So people understand the word jumpstart. Number yeah. one, yeah, you want to say, any, say anything to that, Todd? I was, I was, yeah, for all the chiropractors watching this, if you're not familiar with Dr. Elf Bregg, famous neurosurgeon, his study was showing that stresses to the cord affect lots of stuff, but primarily blood supply to the cord causes demyelination, even looks like certain things that you'd see like in a... MS patient even, looking at possible correlation with cervical kyphosis, MS type of diagnosis or symptoms as far as scarring on the cord. I mean, stuff that's really compelling stuff. Something that I got from you a long time ago that I think about every time I do traction in my neck, every time I'm doing my home care is this is the healthiest position that you can put your body in for that 15 to 20 minute time period. And so like jump starting, right? Get adjusted. But then when you're doing curve correction and you're putting yourself in extension, you're, you're, you're taking physical axial traction force off of your spinal cord, especially if you have any sort of curve reversal or loss of curve. And so now why not put yourself in this position for 20 minutes every day, multiple times a day where you're putting yourself in this jump started healthy position, you get adjusted. There's all kinds of other um, mechanisms as far as how getting adjusted does this, whether it's 
a certain stretch on a spinal ligament and that's what triggers it. So those are some studies that Dr. Dan Murphy talks about, whether it's a stretch on the spinal ligament, whether it's making sure that someone doesn't have increased sustained sympathetic tone, right? Because that's another thing that also makes you sick and causes problems. And I'm sure there's some other mechanisms out there that I'm not up to speed on. I know that there's some new up and coming people in chiropractic that are really exploring this even further. Well, yeah, now here's what we, now here's the thing. The science is for us. So what we're not going to do is communicate information. So, so Todd, Dr. Todd over here is telling the science for you. But you would never say to a patient, hey, we stretch even spinal ligaments will increase nerve flow, right? So so we have to make it simple. And they're in so much fear that if but if they show up, they do have some confidence. They do have some faith. Yeah. But now people are saying, you know, for those people they call, what what can you say? We'll go through that in a sec. But the one liner we learned at the Move Now weekend with you is extension is life, flexion is death. Yeah. Because that's it, right? You got to keep it simple. Extension is life and health. Flexion is sickness, disease, and death. Because which that's is, what it is. Which is something that carries over in the curve. It carries over in the movement. Because in so many of these movements, too, that, that we're measuring on people, and they're stuck in a forward flexed posture or just a hyperkyphotic forward head shift posture, and they can't extend. So that's why we're doing that to reinforce getting mobility back in extension. So now we're talking about not just curve correction and posture, but also movement, which I've used that one liner many times. I think that's a great way to simplify it. Yeah. And there's a, there's actually a whole chapter in here on forward head posture and hyperkyphotic thoracic spine. That's the only posture. The hyperkyphosis is the only posture that is directly associated with a shortened lifespan. You know, and, and Todd was citing the Alfred Bragg study talking about demyelination. There's also studies in here that show with a hyperkyphotic spine, the spinal cord moves directly against the posterior vertebral body, causes compression and demyelination right on the cord that relates to MS, causes scarring and calluses, if you want to call them, on the spinal cord, sclerotic segment, sclerotic areas on the spinal cord. So all that that Alfred Bragg proved is also being proved in more up-to-date studies in here. So I would get this book, go to Elite, Elite, E-L-I-T-E, coachingllc.com, order a book. If you need to order more, just call the Elite number, and uh, I would get these for your patients. Now, how are we going to talk, any, before I go into how are we going to talk to our patients, you want to say anything, Todd? No, I think, I think first thing, as far as, cause a common thing that we're getting, you know, the fact I'm, I, you know, I'm in, I'm in practice every day. I see this. I just left, left with, with patients just an hour ago is um, first and foremost, a couple of things that, that I saw a couple of days ago thought was a good idea is congruent with us not standing out going, no, we're not going to talk about washing hands and we're not going to do anything to improve any sort of sanitation stuff. I think taking that stance is not a good stance to take. But I also think you don't have to go crazy with it and feed into the fear mongering of saying, well, I'm going to walk out to your car and take your temperature and make everyone sit out there. Now, granted, saying, have you traveled somewhere in the last 14 days that's a highly infected area? I don't know how you even define that. At this point, everything's highly infected area, or maybe there's areas that are epicenters that are considered highly affected. You know, so I don't know. Does that mean everyone that's ever traveled at all for 14 days? Or does it mean if you went to the Seattle airport and hung out there, which I was about to do last week, but I canceled my trip mostly because I didn't want to get stuck because I was going to Canada. I didn't want to get stuck in Canada and not be able to come back in the US if they close the border. Something that we're doing is our chiropractic natural version of this. Instead of spraying Clorox and chemicals, I made some spray. I found this nice little recipe online. It's no joke. And, it, and it's always funny because patients always think I'm joking with it because I tell them about it. I'm like, hey, check out the spray I have. And I spray it. It's got essential oils and it. it's lavender on guard. And then it's 100 proof Smirnoff vodka mixed 50-50 with water. So, so I tell them there's vodka in it. They think I'm joking. But vodka is a nice natural way to kill off some some bad stuff. We ask our patients to wash their hands, but we also encourage them to increase host health. And what best way can we do that with chiropractic and what we're doing with improving posture and movement. So that's our conversation that we're having all day long is things you can do to improve this. You made a good point as far as not drowning that in an excessive list of everything else. So it just makes it look like this is another action item. 
but this is like one of the most important things that no one else has on their mind. With that. Yeah. So here's the thing, you know, I think this is an opportunity because in our lifetime, we all know the 1918 story, you know, of the Spanish flu influenza was the worst epidemic ever in the United States. And, you know, one out of 15 medical oh, patients yeah. died. So here's the thing, you know, I think this is an opportunity because in our lifetime, we all know the 1918 story, you know, of the Spanish flu influenza was the worst epidemic ever in the United States. And, you know, one out of 15 medical oh, yeah. patients died, one out of 789. I mean, you can look that all up. So to me, it's like right now you're in this body as a chiropractor. We live for this moment. We weren't here in 1918, but we're here this moment. This is our moment. And so you see all these chiropractors. I'm not saying it's wrong and some may disagree, but people know eat greens. People know how to breathe. You got to breathe. People know to get more rest. But what's the one thing that's going to impact their lives that they don't know? Have a healthy spine have a healthy spine, nervous system, and immune system. So in my opinion, I think we need to really laser sharp focus our message. Yes, you can add other things, but no, the more things you add, the more you dilute the primary foundation. So don't, so don't throw that in at the end as icing. That needs to be the cake. And then if they have questions, you can put a little icing, but that's your cake right now. So, so the whole thing is coming full circle. We're not dealing with the coronavirus, we're dealing with the emotion of fear. And so that means you have to align with them. When, when you're talking to a victim, you have to align with them. You can't be opposite because there's too much emotional momentum out in the world. You know, they're gonna think, they're not gonna think you're crazy, but, but they're already overwhelmed in their mind. So you can't deal with overwhelm with facts and trying to motivate them. So what you have to do is go, yes, Hey, we're all probably exposed. You know, I think you need to be careful and I think you need to limit your contact. So that's great. But let me ask you a question. That's a, that's a famous Joe Borio line. Let me ask you a question. That's, that's his stat. Is I'd say you are going to step out of the house at least once. Would you agree? Are you going to step out of the house? So yeah. do you want to wait and hide and use a strategy of hope for the health and life of your family? Is that the main strategy? Because that's what medicine tells you to do. Do you want to use a strategy of hope? Or do you want to take control of your life and have power in your life to have a strong, healthy immune system? Because only because healthy people don't get sick. So if healthy people don't get sick, do you want to have hope? Or do you want to have power and control and protection? Which one? They're going to say that. I want to have control, power, and protection. Then you go, great. So if you're going to walk out of your house during the day, where's the best place to go? And you point to the ground. They go, here's where you get your body, keep your body healthy. Here's where you keep yourself protected. Here's where you keep yourself safe. Now, am I saying the chiropractor is going to help? What claim am I making? You're going to have a strong immune system? Did I, did I claim anything? No, here's where you stay protected. Because that, and, and it's in the research. So you make statements like that. So, you know, if you feel weak or you feel tired, jumpstart your nervous system. So if you jumpstart your nervous system, what also increases? And you make them say it. They say my immune system and say, that's why you come here. Is that how you ready? Is that how you live your life? You say questions like if they say, doc, I really want to stay home. You know, I'm home. Then I say, are you staying home because it's convenient or are you staying home because you're scared? Because you got to find out because some people, they're staying home. Well, I'm home. I'll just stay home because they're doing it for convenience. And then you say, is a weak immune system or getting sick? For, is getting sick Is that convenient? No. So that means if you want to stay healthy, is it always going to be convenient? No. So keeping your immune system strong is how you take control over your life in an uncontrollable situation. Would you agree? Yes. Because that's what it's about. It's about control and certainty where there's uncertainty. So if you're in an uncontrollable situation, but the one thing you can do gives you control and power over the health for you and your family, would you do that once? Yeah. Then great. Come on in. Building off that, let's say, for example, Someone calls up and they say, hey, I'm, I'm 30 years old. I'm taking care of my 85-year-old grandparent. 
So, yeah, on the same note, don't go to places where you're going to ex- expose yourself and possibly bring something home. But but something that you were saying, which I thought was great, a great way to handle that, but I think something that has to be at least put in place to be able to really address that objection or that fear properly is don't go to places that aren't necessary f- for you to go to in places that are high exposure right now. Well, did you know that we're doing this, this, this in our clinic so that you can rest at ease with at least we have that under control and then the main thing is is talking about what you said you ask them hey are you going to go out are you going to go outside for anything are you going to go to the grocery store are you going to go anywhere you then take them through that process of why they should understand that if they're going to be going outside and they have to keep themselves strong and healthy they should be coming in getting checked and getting adjusted yeah now the difference is when they're so immersed in fear you telling them what to do isn't always going to work. So you just have to turn that into a question. So you say, are you going to be going outside? Are you going to be going to the grocery store? Yeah. So basically you're already being exposed. So as long as you're exposed, would coming here and keeping your immune system strong be a great thing for you to do? Because the stronger your immune system, now I don't know the science of this, but I do know if you got a really strong immune system, would you be less contagious? I don't know. Know that answer, but if you got a strong immune system fighting it, I would imagine it might make a hair of a difference on if you're how contagious you are. Now I don't, I'm not an epidemiologist, so so I don't know. But the bottom line is, are you going outside? You're already exposed. Are you going to the grocery store? You're already exposed. So the question would be, either you don't take care of your of your 85 year old mom or whatever it is, or you do the best to keep your body healthy and make you as least contagious as possible, if, if you can. But at least keep your body strong. And then the next thing I'd say is, can you bring your 85-year-old mother in here? Something that, that I offered to my patients, a lot of you doctors might want to offer to your patients, is if you have people that are immunocompromised and they're super paranoid about being around other people, is you could set aside little times, if you have a really busy practice with a ton of people in there, set aside little times at the end of the shift when it starts to clear out as far as then having those people come in. And so that's something that we're offering. We have some patients that are pretty concerned about not wanting to come in when there's a bunch of other people around. So there's certainly ways to adapt. So the bottom line is what I'm talking about is the mental emotional fear. And what Todd's talking about is actually the structure to take care of them. The thing is though, you have to handle the mental emotional fear or you won't have anybody to come in on those off hours. You know what I mean? That's the thing is, and if you notice what I'm doing, is I'm not giving them information. You know, it's like you have to have doctor knowledge, but you have to talk to them like a person. Meaning, meaning what's the knowledge? Hey, coronavirus is airborne. But I'm gonna say, well, coronavirus is airborne, so if you go outside, you're gonna get all the exposure. No, I'm not gonna say it. What am I gonna say? Hey, you're gonna go outside? By the way, when you're outside, are you gonna breathe? Then you're already exposed. So the question is, do you wanna have power and control Right? You want to be able to protect yourself, have the power and the ability to protect yourself. You know, this is my brain thinking this is like technically, if you go outside, you are risking being exposed. You're exposed to the sensor outside, you're exposed to the sensor, but you're not, te- you're not technically exposed to a virus, the boogeyman. There's a risk that you're being exposed. So if you're going to go out and already take that risk, then shouldn't you just stop by here at the clinic on your way home and do this, this, and this to boost your? I mean, would that make sense? I could add that little tweak to make it. A little bit that much more accurate. More accurate. So have, I'm just saying from a standpoint of like the state board coming in and going, well, let's take everything you said and let's put you on a platter and, and see if we can dissect it apart. Now, yeah. also, the intention is when you look at, like I'm looking at what are the steps to change a person from a le- the least empowered emotional state into the until where they take emotionally empowered action. And so, and, and so that's why what I'm saying is a bit dramatic because it's a pattern interrupt. You're pattern interrupting their emotion. And so, yeah, say, hey, you just put yourself at risk of exposure. Are you walking in a grocery store? Are you going to touch anything in the grocery store? Is everybody in the grocery store wearing Playtex gloves? You know what I mean? So, so what's the probability that your exposure is going to be a lot higher? Great. So if you just consider yourself exposed, now what are you going to do to have the optimal chance to be the least contagious and the most healthy? Because healthy people don't get sick. 
Yeah. And then that's it. Then they're like, okay, so what you do is you put them in a position where, okay, now I'm vulnerable, which we all are. The difference is we're not worried about it because we have confidence and faith in our health. So now, and I was telling you this story before, so I'll tell this real quick. My mom called me last night, she's 83 years old, you know, old Italian Catholic, you know, she's like, if there's a problem, man, she's going to talk about it. So, so she started the conversation with, now, Fred, I want to tell you this, and I don't want you to interrupt me because I know you're not going to listen because you get adjusted, but everybody else in the world doesn't. And that, that hit me like my mom gets it and that's the problem. So she's talking to me like I'm wrong while she's justifying the chiropractic principle of why we think the way we do. So the bottom line, we said, don't go near your dad because he's 88 years old. So I'm like, dad's going to live if I don't see him for three weeks. It's all good. So, And then the funny part of that story was, don't go near your sister. I have a, my older sister is only nine months older than me. I'm 59. She's 60. I started laughing, man. I'm, I'm going to call my sister Lisa and tell her mom thinks she's an old woman. So, so that was funny. But the bottom line, you know, the bottom line here is, you know, she spoke the truth, even though she was trying to make a point. And this is our purpose. But I'm, the reason we're on here, it's not going to be through information. It's going to be through handling the emotional overwhelm of fear. And so what is that? Are you going to watch and wait and hope? Because that's the only strategy you given are you gonna are you gonna protect yourself you and the health of your family are you gonna protect yourself is this the last infectious epidemic viral epidemic that we're ever gonna go through no we go through one every year minimally with influenza God knows what else the government's gonna genetically engineer for some country in the world with biochemical warfare so how are we gonna live our life so what this is and I would tell people I say this What's the confidence in your health? Are you are you actually fearful about this potential epidemic? And they say yes. Do you think it's going to be the last one you go through? No. Or do you think we're going to go through one every year, minimal every year, minimally with influenza? And you'd say yeah, and they'd say yes. I go. Do you want to live your life with confidence in your health that no matter what goes on outside of you, you have the confidence inside out with a health for you and your family? Now that reframed, that reframed the emotion in their mind. But notice I did it through a series of questions, not giving them information. Because you're, when you ask them a question and they agree, you're taking them through a step-by-step -step mental emotional process to change the emotional meaning in their, in their mind. Now here's the deal. If you want to change behavior, you have to change the emotion that's driving the behavior. And that's with any self-empowerment. You want to change the behavior, you have to change the emotion that's driving the behavior. And this is a massive fear-based survival emotion. And the primary positive intent for survival is protection. And that needs to be in your message. Boom, drop the mic. There you go. Yeah, I'm like, how are they going to stay? <laughs> what am I going to say after that? Yes. Okay. Awesome. Cool. Great. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of, a lot lot of, of great communication tips you put through there, a lot of truth you're talking through there. And ultimately, at the end of the day, I'm getting adjusted. I'm going to go adjust my family right after this. <laughs> after we get off there. And then, and then I'm going to do some I'm gonna do some traction on my neck. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so I'm going to look playground because tomorrow is supposed to be my back day and uh, the gym's closed so I gotta go find a pull-up bar somewhere around town yeah at a playground you do that you can play <laughs> which is wait which is uh, earlier before we started this Fred was saying that he was thinking about me he's envious of me and it's because I have a full home gym yeah it's not gonna I'm thinking about you at five o'clock this morning when my alarm went off oh man well you could always come out here and hang out with us for a while yeah, actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to develop a workout on the local play, neighborhood playground monkey bars, and then I'm like, here's what you do during epidemics. Right, right. <laughs> monkey bars. <laughs> well, this weekend in our clinic, we had this plan for a couple weeks. I'm not planning on canceling it, but we're doing a introduction to kettlebell workshop with our patients. Oh, there you go. And uh, the cool thing about kettlebells is when you learn how to use them, you can literally have 
two, three kettlebells at home, you can do your full workout with three kettlebells. That's yeah, all you need. I'll be learning that soon. Yeah. Cool. All right, brother. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone out there. Get plug for this, man. This book will change your life, change the lives of your patients back to health. Go to Elite, E L I T E, Coaching, L L C. Dot com. There you can buy one, but if you want to buy more for your patients, which you read this, you'll want to give them to your patients. Uh, just call Dana, and uh, there's obviously a bulk price order. So so check it out. Minimally get one for you, one for your staff, and then uh, patients love it, man. And I will, I will. And I'll put that, I'll put your website in the comments section if anyone needs to get some books. And uh, everyone stay Stay safe, stay healthy. Dr. Fred, thanks for taking the time to do this. Thanks for reaching out and offering to do this. This is all helpful information. I'm going to have my staff go through and watch this so they can get some little words of wisdom from this as well. Cool. Cool. Thanks, man. All right, buddy. Peace.